This is Runehammer. RPG Talks. Design theory, Q&A, and counter methods, story building, DM deep thinking, and game building. It's all right here. So strap in, and may your dice roll high. Greetings, programs. It's Hanker and Fernail here, and I'm going to sing a little bit of song. A two. Kind of tiny hell when I choke time. About a loony kind of what? Hey, nah. Ooh. Nine a chair, kind of toe. What is that soothing sound of paper being thumbed in the background? Ooh, doesn't that sound nice? That's just me flipping my way through the book here. To one of the all-time most favoritest of the pages. This is, requires a little bit of spine bending. Welcome everybody back to RPG Talks here on Runehammer. It's October. I hope everyone had as much fun with a letter to Agnes as I did. That was a great time. There is another horror story coming this month. Uh, and there is A Burning in New Haven Part 2, which is two more chapters of that dark tale. Coming your way, Bobby Dudoni. Okay, so, um. Oh, what's that creaking noise? A creature at my doorway. Anyway, RPG Talks. This is uh, episode five, I do believe. And we are going to go into the, uh, the sort of runner up or number two spot on you guys' poll for, you know, what would make a good talk? What makes good listening? You're, you're cruising along on your commute, you know, the other cars, they're, they're coming and going, they're going too slow. They're merging poorly. They're putting on their signal too late or too early. <laughs> and you're just looking for something to, you know, get your mind off of this business and think back into RPG land where everything's cool. So what we're going to talk about today is the sacred, the sanctified, the sullied. Oh, wait, it's not sullied. The secret. And it's not a secret either. The stupendous GM's Oath. The Oath of the Dungeon Master, really, is what it's called. Now, technically, Dungeon Master is uh, a term that apparently has trademark issues around it, which is really disappointing to me. Really disappointing. They should just let that go. It's over. But, for the sake of this podcast, we can call it the Oath of the Dungeon Master. Now, in print, I'm going to have to call it the Game Master's Oath. But, uh... It truly is an oath of dungeon masters. Now, if you guys are uh, reading along in your wooden pew out there in the uh, in the Church of Index Card RPG, please open your texts to page fifty-eight. the The oath of the dungeon master was uh, a piece of writing that I've been working on for a long time. As many of you know, it started in uh, another project called The Deadly Architect. Now, originally, The Deadly Architect was going to be an entire book devoted just to the art of being a dungeon master. What I started realizing in time is that without a game for more context, namely a system and, and a, a tone, a mood, trying to define the art of the dungeon master became very general, and, and I did not like that. Uh, you know how I am with generalization. I'm not a fan. I like to be very, very specific. So the Deadly Architect sat in cold storage for more than a year. Um, and then as ICRPG was coming together, that awesome oath was back in the back of my head and uh, it needed to find its way into the book. The Oath of the Dungeon Master. Okay, so it finally found its way into a book and found its way out to a lot of people and... Uh, you know, in some ways, yeah, it's just sort of motivational generalization. It's just inspiring words. There isn't like this shocking lightning bolt of content that's going to change your game tomorrow night. But a lot of people got back to me uh, after reading the book and saying this was one of their favorite little pieces. And maybe it's just because it brought into focus thoughts that they've been having for years or thoughts that they were hoping to hear from an outside voice that would serve as an affirmation, you know. So I think just the limbic system of the Dungeon Master responds well to the stanzas or the, the sections or the, the lines of 
the Dungeon Master's Oath. So, the purpose of today's RPG talk is can it, sort of going deeper into each one of the lines. Um, there's, I think, what, nine lines to it? And uh, each one, of course, has a little blurb in the book. So I'm not just going to repeat the blurb in the book. I just wanted to give you my thoughts where each line came from and maybe ways that you can take it further in your game because we're always looking for ways to take our game just a little bit further or maybe we're we're cooked and we're burned out or maybe we're about to start a new group or hoping to find a new group and look for that tone there's so many different phases of rpg life <laughs> i've been really realizing that a great deal lately as i'm starting to think about pulling an, a table group back together again and maybe even making like a weekly group in a neutral location and podcasting it and really kind of going for it to do a big campaign and when you start thinking that way, you want to up your game, you, you know, how can I improve and where and why and so on and so forth. So the very first premise of the Dungeon Master's Oath, I will let the torrent flow. I will let the torrent flow. Now, the most key element of this part of the oath and why you vow this to yourself, it's not saying I'm going to do a bunch of stuff. I'm going to be a flood of ideas. I'm going to I'm just going to keep going all the time. That's not the point, really, of the torrent. It's letting the torrent flow. It's, it's an allowing. It's like the Zen mind, beginner's mind. Thoughts come and thoughts go. Your only job is to make no ado of it, to let it happen. The torrent is already happening inside your head. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be listening to this. Um, what is this thing? Is this a podcast? <laughs> The torrent's already happening. You're already interested in a bunch of things. You already want a bunch of things. You're, you're reaching. You're, you're craving. That is the torrent. The letting part, the allowing part, is to simply remove your judgmental mind, your adult mind, your big mind, and let that small mind that just wants a thing to happen just take the driver's seat. And I think very often, because our our hobby can be complicated. This step is very easy to say. You know, just let it happen, guys. Just write down whatever pops in your head. Boy, uh, thanks a lot, Hanker, and that's real useful. <laughs> oh. The real lesson is actually much more difficult to fully absorb. And that's because our minds are so cluttered with so many things, and they range from the totally banal and unrelated everyday concerns, that guy's turn signal, what am I going to have for lunch, one of my shoelaces is untied, all the way over to nuanced and complex thoughts about, well, this time around, I want to make a campaign that's really going to make, you know, that one player, you know, Sally, get excited and really show up to the table each week. And I want to craft the story in a way that it's not just about her, but it pulls her in. Hmm. Okay. How can I do that? Well, that's a that is a complex and nuanced desire to not only fulfill these surface mind issues, the monkey mind, as some of the Zen masters have called it, because it's so active and so wiggly, to satisfy that part of the mind, but then also to allow the little mind to just write down the word barbarian because I think barbarians are cool. What does that mean for my campaign? I have no idea. But to write it down is the first step in saying to yourself, that little mind matters. That silly, unplanned, poorly thought out, little impulse mind matters. And I'm going to document it. Okay, I've been doing that for half an hour now. I have a bunch of unrelated words here. Time for the old left brain to kick in and do some hard work. But that letting the torrent flow, the key word in that piece of the oath is the word let, to allow, to take your defenses down, to take your judgment down. Let yourself be imaginative. Let yourself be silly. Let yourself be serious. And find there in that little mind those things that have kept you coming back to this hobby again and again. The second one is a much more nuts and bolts type item. I will remember everything. I will remember everything. Now, this is a sort of a call to action 
to dungeon masters out there. This is asking more of you. And since the oath is something that you say to yourself, this is something you're asking of yourself. This is something you're vowing unto yourself. No one's going to check you on this. You will not be graded on this quiz. Only you will ever really know. Your players will also know a little bit because they'll get that moment of delight of thinking that a thing was gone, but there it is. One of the modern masters of this skill has got to be Matt Mercer. Now, I don't know if he has assistants helping him with bullet notes or if he's just brilliant. Probably a little bit of both, maybe. But the way that details in their campaign rose and fell and then were renewed and came back at the moment you didn't expect was brilliant. And this is what the oath is asking of you now, is to remember all the details. Now, that doesn't mean write everything down, because to write a thing down and to remember a thing are very different activities. When you write a thing down, it becomes somewhat static. It becomes part of an ever-growing sheaf of piles of reams of papers and notes and bullet points. But when you remember, it's on call, it's there, it's ready in the moment. And this applies to character details, historical events, detailed things that happened in the campaign, snacks that were brought, rule nuances, spell descriptions, class progression, XP values, challenge ratings, legendary actions. <laughs> this is everything in the wide sense of the term. Everything about your game and your hobby you're going to retain. Now, okay, that is a nice, high-minded ideal, right? That sounds fantastic. I totally want to be that way. Man, Hankerin, sounds great. There's one problem. I don't remember everything. Okay, so now you're going to get into the challenging area of using mnemonic tools to actually improve how smart you are and how well you retain information. Now, everyone learns and retains differently. Some people are write-down rememberers. Sometimes some people are audio rememberers. They hear a thing and it just pops right into their memory for good. Other people can see a thing or read a thing and it will go into their memory. I can't tell you the best technique to use, but what I can do is invite you to look into it. Take a look into what mnemonic devices are. Take a look into what ones have proven to be the most successful over the decades, because some definitely rise above others. And then do some experiments with yourself of the way that you learn. Use this knowledge to make your game better. For me, it's definitely bullet listing. When I bullet list things, I just remember them. I almost never have to look back at the bullet list, but I, I have to bullet list that in a certain way and in a certain environment. I can't have other stimulus happening. I usually, this may sound silly, but I like to have a cold beer sitting right there by me. It's almost like a, an affectation, I think is the word. It's, it's a device. It isn't that drinking a bunch of beer makes me remember things, because I think that's probably ludicrous. But having it there, it's like Linus's blanket. It's a focal point for my intellect, and it helps me to access those parts of my mind that more accurately and readily absorb and retain information. So take a look in your own life and your own habits and find those mnemonic devices, use them, and as the oath proclaims, remember everything. I will build a world from their actions. Ho, ho, ho. This is a doozy. You know what's really fun when you're a dungeon master? Sitting down, creating a whole world and a whole campaign and a whole story arc, and then, oops, you're a novelist. A dungeon master has no idea what's going to happen. A good one. You don't have to create a, a sandbox world like Super Mario 2 or something where they can go anywhere. They, you don't have to create Skyrim. You don't have to create Red Dead, right? What you do need is... A good night of fun that has some open-ended options, be they overt or sort of innate in the adventure, implied or overt. And then players will choose those through their actions and their preferences and dreams and ambitions. <laughs> Your job as the dungeon master then 
is to take this and say, oh, you know what that could mean? This guy over here isn't a guy at all. He's like some kind of seraph from ancient times who's come to avenge the hibbity-dibbity of the dibbity-doo. Okay, and then off you go to the races, right? Creating a world from their actions means you don't get to make the whole thing. You get to make a little piece, then you get to see what they do, scratch your chin back on your own time, and make more. You don't have to have each session be this wild spaghetti of choices going all new directions. But between sessions, you are building that world based on what they assumed, what they dream of, what they did and what they didn't do, what they left undone and had no interest in, what they want to avenge. Probably the biggest question in building your campaign is you guys know how this goes. Toward the end of an adventure, whether it's still sort of in official table time or like as you guys are snacking and packing up your gear and heading home, the DM will also always ask, you know, so what do you guys think like next time? Do you think you're going to take the stagecoach up to the mountain or like do you want to head over to the glacier or do you guys have something else in mind? And then there's a quick convo, glibbity, glibbity, glibbity. Now, if you're clever, the players will not think much of what they say in that moment, but you're listening at your utmost attentiveness. And this, the minute they're all out of the door, you're bulleting down what they said, then walk away. And tomorrow you can start to think about how to worldify those statements. But to take this part of the oath seriously, you really have to accept the challenge of not making your whole campaign in one sweeping, wondrous arc. Behold my genius. That's not part of of the oath. Behold my storytelling as I create this entire sandbox world. Now you can go anywhere in it and have no impact on it because it's already written. (laughs) Not cool, bro. Or at least not as cool as it could be. And that's what the oath is all about. Seeing the best path and then using it as an affirmation. Uh, Like Bruce Lee said, I imagine myself as the student hearing my own voice as that of the teacher. And this is an internal dialogue method that lets you say high-minded things to yourself without proclaiming that you already have mastered those things. It lets you talk to yourself in your smartest, biggest voice without feeling pompous, basically. (laughs) Use that inner teacher voice, use the inner student, and keep working toward the dream of building an entire world from a set of player actions. Boy, this next one is very nuts and bolts very, very practical, very down to earth. I will be an architect. Now, I, I didn't even mean this in any metaphorical sense. I literally am saying, study architecture. <laughs> like there's no, there's very little hidden depth here. Take a look at at least like the wiki on the basics of architecture or environmental design. Either one is fine. They both have tons of things to educate you about how space can be used to induce reaction and to induce emotion in people. Even if you do complete theater of the mind, actually more so if you do theater of the mind, are you going to need the skill of architecture? You guys have probably seen this one product out there called Anonymous, or not Anonymous, um, Anomalous Underground Space or Dwelling or something like that, right? And it's basically a pun on the fact that dungeons make no sense. They're like these one-way tunnels that go nowhere, that have all these twists and turns for no reason, right? And it's kind of funning on that. Now, you're definitely going to go a long way with Anomalous Underground Dwellings. But if you have some of the more architectural unities on your side, you're going to go much further. And these unities include things like symmetry. They include things like indirect eye lines and and the contrast between large and small spaces to create sensations. The use of vertical versus horizontal. The use of high versus low and so on and so forth. And what these mean to people the players won't know what their limbic system has to say about architectural unities. <laughs> but over time, you will see that this really matters. If, if there's one huge one that I can offer, I'd say it would be symmetry. If you walk into a door on one side of a structure or a space, you expect there to be a door in a similar or exact same location on the far side. 
if it's there, you get this feeling of reward. It's a nice feeling. It's the opposite of that feeling like walking through, you know, a department store where they put the doors in random places to get you to squiggle through the space to shop more. I hate that. (laughs) Now, your players may not perceive it in such tangible fashion as you do when you're in the mall. But believe me, those sensations are still there. So be an architect. Look into it. What is architecture? Why is it fascinating? A lot of what dungeon mastering is is architecture. Now, of course, there are other more nuanced dimensions, lots of them. But this point in the oath is very simple, very practical, and very literal. I will be an architect. Now, on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, the architect is the Vulcan, right? The next item is, I will be poetic. Now, Not many modern thinkers would draw many parallels between the art of being poetic and the art of being architectural. But in Aristotle's time, these two things went together hand in hand, and they go hand in hand for you too, because you are a dungeon master. You are taking the oath. To be poetic means to see gravity, to see redemption, to see morality, to see dilemma, to see agony, to see wrath, to see lust in the details. And not only to see it, but then to manifest it and not be scared. Being poetic is super embarrassing, you guys. (laughs) In daily life, being poetic is super weird. I know because I do it too often. And it's weird. Now, I know that I've built a sort of a reputation around myself for saying poetic things and having poetic feelings and being very honest about them, right? But that is not an easy reputation to build. Being poetic means openly displaying emotion and also seeing it and seeds of it in small places and and openly Uh, nurturing or cultivating the emotional impact of words and actions and how they interlock in human emotion. And you, as the dungeon master, need the courage to be honest about those emotions and honest about displaying them. D&D can wear very thin if if you don't have emotion. You find yourself in like gag one shots right? Or endless combat that just feels like slogging. Poetry is the moment that a thing that happened is related to another one and what seemed lost is found again, or what seemed found is now lost. It's also letting things sink in. I've noticed recently that in a lot of games, both dungeon masters and players are spending a lot of time describing. And they're usually describing things that are just literal. And I would also use this as a critique against a lot of fantasy novelists that I've been reading recently. They they describe literal events to me. The guy pried open the door, and man, when he did, ooh, that lock popped right off there, and the door flew open, and whoa. He stabbed that guy so hard, the guy's eyeballs popped out and then fell down. I shot this guy right in the neck and the back of his neck popped out and went all over the wall. And let me tell you what, right? All this time being used on the literal description of nuts and boltsy events could be far better used to describe emotion. But the raw truth of it is that this is very difficult to do. It can be embarrassing, it can feel awkward, and it can be the absolute antipode or the furthest reach of role-playing. Everyone does a funny accent, and everyone makes choices in the uh, action scenes that fit their characters, right? Those are the fundamentals of role-playing. But the outer edges of role-playing are actually feeling the emotions, being poetic inside your character hoping for what your character hopes for and feeling tragedy 
when your character experiences tragedy. And you as a dungeon master, once again, have to be a beacon to create a safe environment for people to feel these sensations and not feel silly and not feel weird. Have you guys uh, have probably heard my whole talk about dorking, right? The DM has a responsibility to be the biggest dork at the table. If you're the biggest dork, you're the most enthusiastic, the most socially awkward, everyone else looks cool and they feel safe to really dork out over the game. Because man, the DM is just, his, his mind is just exploding thinking about you reaching fourth level and all these new spell options you're going to have. Oh my God, we're just going to sit and we're just going to shop for spells for hours. It's going to be so cool. Now suddenly you are like, well, I was just going to pick a couple and move on. You feel all cool all of a sudden. And it's the same with being poetic. As the dungeon master, if you set the tone as a poetic tone, as an emotionally open tone, everyone at the table doesn't have to be at that level, but they can feel safe being at their level. And that's why this one is so nuanced and so important to the deeper realms of dungeon mastering. And it's going to be difficult in a one shot. I'm just going to come right out there and say it. it's going to be hard. One shots have a lot of action. They have a lot of sort of shaving a haircut kind of feel to them. And it's hard to build enough context to feel this stuff. But in a two, three or more session campaign, the, the seeds are going to be growing and it's up to you to cultivate them. So be poetic. Now, the next one, I've never had any trouble with. But I have had both players and dungeon masters who have a heck of a time with this one. And the the, the oath piece here is, I will be energetic. I will be energetic. I will show up ready to jam. I can barely control myself. I'm so excited to do a recap of the last session so we can get into this. Now, a great example of someone who is like ridiculously energetic about D&D is Matt Colville. This guy can barely keep himself from talking a million miles an hour because you can tell he's just enthusiastic about the crap that went down or his new idea about how to play undead. He just, he's just ripping through it. A lot of dungeon masters and players show up to this game in a sort of a median level of energy. Not like, you know, hey, okay, well, last time we do... Okay, that's an extreme case, right? <laughs> no need to give that guy a hard time. He's, he probably just ran over his dog or something. But you know what I mean by median level, okay? It's just sort of an even level like this. And um, we're, we're going to play some D&D tonight. And uh, last session, I'm pretty sure the ranger got killed. And uh, there's a tentacle that is on the ship. And um, yeah, what do you guys want to do? That's not energetic. You don't have to be a spaz all the time. But what you do need is excitement. You need to honestly be approaching the game like, yes, I'm here. Time to play. Now, it doesn't have to last every second. It doesn't have to be in every word you say. You don't have to wave your arms like a madman or mad woman. <laughs> But that energy is clutch. If you need a Red Bull, drink it. If you need a cup of coffee, hit it. You're that five-hour five energy weirdo, or you need to go for a jog or whatever, then you do it. But you use whatever tool you need to, especially in the first hour, to be super attentive, to be high energy, to be gestural, to be vocal, to be excited. Just like poetry. The energy level of the table is going to riff on your energy level. If it's low, people are on their phones in the first 10 minutes. If it's high, you could probably get them through a couple hours before they're on their phone. <laughs> this one doesn't really need a lot of whipping to it. It's extremely literal, extremely simple, and very, very easy to do. You don't need to change the way you think. You don't need to become smarter. You don't need any of this stuff. You don't need to learn anything to be energetic. All you need to do is rally. Rally up, bring yourself to the table, and show the hell up. I don't care how tired you are. Set your tired aside and show up and have fun. Whew. This next one, pretty weird. This next one's tough. I will lift them up and I will vanish. Being a player's biggest fan has always been a staple of many you know, writings about how to be a good dungeon master. You're a fan of the players. You love their characters and you want to see them win, right? 
You want to see Michael Knight beat the oddball bad guys when you're watching Knight Rider because you think Michael Knight is cool. And you have that same feeling about your players' characters and your players themselves. You want them to win because woo! But here's the thing. When it comes time to really reap the glory for who's the coolest at the table, it cannot be you. It has to be them. And this is an ongoing skill that you're going to have to learn. The biggest way you can break this rule is by making an NPC who is cooler than the player's characters. Classic mistake by a dungeon master. You meet this guy, and he's actually like a six-level spellcaster, and he says he's going to help with the mission. And then he starts casting like all these badass spells that your second level wizard can't do. Oh boy. You are not lifting them up and you are definitely not vanishing. All of your actions should not only reaffirm the player's characters are some of the very coolest people in this world, except maybe some of the epic villains, right? But also it's not because of you that they're cool. And I'm speaking about the dungeon master. It's because of them. They made their player cool. It's not because this world happens to be weaker than them because the dungeon master made it that way. No, it's because the way the player is executing his hero makes them cooler than the NPCs, makes them cooler than the enemies or even the villains. Now, how do you do this? It's the way that player and character actions impact your world and who reaps the glory, which is them. This is letting player agency be the coolest thing in a session. If you have a high damage, say, environmental hazard, that's fine. Be brutal with your high damage environmental hazard, but don't talk about it a bunch. It just delivers its damage and moves on. You don't describe in great detail these rocks and how they fell on the player's heads. No, your description, your time, and your enthusiasm go into how the characters respond even when they're crushed by the rocks how they're heroic, how a lesser man would already be dead, but not you. You just took 14 damage. You still have two hit points left and you're back in the fight because you're a hero. Not man, did you see how cool that was that my rocks fell and just crushed the hell out of you? (laughs) So not only are you lifting them up, you're also removing yourself from the equation as the dungeon master, making sure that they are the ones invested. If you're a dungeon master, you're already so into this hobby and this game, you do not need any encouragement. I mean, except being a human being, you're definitely going to want some love, right? Everybody wants a little bit of love. But I mean, at a session, one of your goals is to make players remember, man, do I want to play again next week? Because they'll come, they'll have more fun, they'll role play better, they'll have better details, that everything will be cooler. And your dungeon master's dream, which I bet you guys know what I'm talking about, will be closer to coming true. The way you visualize the game and dream about the game being will be closer the more excited the players are. So lift them up and vanish. The next one is not only a skill of dungeon mastering, but in life. And that is, I will be a beacon of camaraderie. This can be hard sometimes. This can be very hard. There are parts of our hobby that can be solitary. You know, when you're crafting, you're writing. I'm in one of those phases right now. I'm I'm in the solo phase. I mean, partially I'm just, you know, up to my neck in stuff. You know, I'm doing a lot of commissions and I'm trying to get another book out and doing some game design and doing all this. And so I'm in the solitary mode. But once a game is engaged... Just like the dorking, just like being poetic, just like being energetic, you want to make friends better friends. You want to raise toasts. You want to remind each other, man, I love it when we hang out together. You guys make me feel cool. You know that? I'm just going to be cheesy and come right out and say it. I don't care. What do I have to lose? (laughs) Hey, I can't wait to see you guys this week. It's going to be awesome. You know, I like it when you come over to my house because then I have food. You guys, I've got a confession. I did not clean the bathroom for the session this week. So you're going to be looking at last week's poop. Because, (laughs) by the way, the toilet doesn't work either. (laughs) Okay, it took five episodes of RPG Talks to reach bathroom humor. Anyways, you guys get what I'm saying. It's, It's just like being poetic. It's having the nerve to come out in the open and say, you guys are cool. 
I like you guys. You're my friends. Did I ever tell you that? Now, usually alcohol is your buddy when it comes to saying this kind of stuff because modern life has not really uh, prepared or trained us to be honest about fellowship and about friendship and about openly stating, you guys are great, man. Or if, if two people aren't getting along, to, to mending that fence and to bringing them together. To always seeing the positive, always wanting to bring the group together. Knowing the, the context of each person and what they're going through in, you know, IRL and so on and so forth. And, and what, what it means for the game and, and to be accommodating of it and also encouraging and also demanding to ask that they push themselves. It's one of my favorite features in a good friend. Is that they, they push me to rise up to my ultimate self, but they also totally understand what I'm going through and give me a little bit of space. Now, you are doing all these things as the dungeon master. This is tough, man. There's a lot of stuff to do all of a sudden. But you only have to do the things in the oath if you're reaching for the highest levels. And being a beacon of camaraderie is a huge element of reaching to the highest level. It's always reminding each other they love each other. Always reminding them that you love them. Go in for the hug, man. Go in for the hug. <laughs> Finally, and this is, I think, actually one of the most um, sort of gagged on elements. And I don't mean like, Argh! I mean, there's a lot of gags about it. The most joked about, the most memed element of being a dungeon master, which is, I will be a terror to behold. You know, in almost everything you see online, the dungeon master is portrayed as this sadistic, math freak who's out to make you know players cry and tear up their character sheets or burn their character sheets or like this whole dumb myth about how dungeon masters enjoy killing players and how oh man i wonder if we're going to be able to survive tonight because the dungeon master's got that wicked grin on his face right right this is a really common sort of stereotype of what a dungeon master is is this kind of socially maladjusted super nerd who gets some kind of twisted pleasure out of undoing other people's work in the game. Well, for the sake of this part of the oath, that is exactly what you're going to do. Now, I am totally not a believer in stuff like tearing up character sheets and like reveling in character death. I, I don't No, I can't. That's not part of my game. It never will be. I do not see that as good. I, th I see that as DM bullying, really. But I'll sure as hell kill your character. And I will bring the tools I have to the table to make this business deadly. I will have devious secrets. And when you learn them, you will shudder. I will reveal things that you don't want to be revealed. I will take you down tunnels that you didn't want to go down. I will drop the floor out. My monsters will be sneaky and devious and deceitful. I will try to tear you apart, but I will work within the tools of the game just like the players have to. And this is why, if you really do want to live by being a terror to behold, you cannot have a DM screen. There is nothing more terrifying in this world than the truth. And to know that that truth is, is non-negotiable, is, is immutable, out in the open. When those dice roll, that fear that you fantasize about as a dungeon master, you can feel it in the air. When there's a high damage roll coming in, it's a perfect moment. And a dungeon master rolls it out in the open. You know, high damage spikes, accidental high damage spikes, are probably the most nerfed thing in the game as far as what's happening behind the DM screen, right? You all know it. Come on, just admit it. You don't want to kill people on accident. That's not cool. But if you're rolling out in the open, oh, God, the terror. It's, it's like peeling back the veil of the cosmos and looking into the very workings of the universe. <laughs> There's no veil. There's no frosting. There's no fog. It's the absolute and the truth is non-negotiable because all of you see it at the same time. It, whoo, 
So when those 4d8 roll, man, there is a possibility of 32 damage there, and that is a real possibility, and it will not be nerfed. Being a terror to behold does not mean that you are taking pleasure in the fact that you're the dungeon master, and therefore you have some kind of leg up as a destructive force. No. Being a terror to behold means that your players are afraid of the world. They're afraid of the truth. They're afraid of the results of their own actions. They're not afraid of you as a person. The world, the monsters, and the story are what's terrifying. And you're creating that together. As the dungeon master, you're just the sort of the moderator. You're just moving the sausage from one part of the factory to the other. The fact that every once in a while there's a skull in one of the sausages, now that's terrifying. <laughs> I don't know what the hell that metaphor is, <laughs> but there you have it. There's a skull in the sausage, my friends. There's a skull in the sausage. And that is the entirety of the Dungeon Master's Oath. I hope that it's as illuminating and as rejuvenating for you guys as it is for me. I love to, every few weeks, just look bad at, back at it, tell myself I'm doing those things, ask myself if I'm doing those things, renew my efforts. I know that renewing your efforts is a huge part of this hobby because sometimes you're just cooked out on it and you just don't want to keep going. A few days or weeks pass, sometimes it's even years. Then you return, you redouble, you're excited again, and the oath is useful again. So I hope it serves that function in your life as it does in mine. This is Hank Renfernail. You've been listening to Runehammer. This is RPG Talks, Episode 5. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And uh, strength, honor, and the Dungeon Master's Oath. I'll see you guys on the internet. Peace out. <laughs>